All right, welcome to today's workshop. Case studies and simulations are often used in face-to-face -face modalities, but they can be a great learning tool for your online courses as well. Um, asynchronous learning in particular may lead students to feeling disconnected because they lose that sense of interaction that's inherent in face-to-face -face, uh, modality. So humanizing the online classroom is an important step in creating an engaging and interactive learning environment for students and encouraging connections and interaction between students. So in this workshop, we're gonna be discussing how employing case studies and simulations in online classes can help to humanize our courses and to improve student engagement and learning outcomes. Um, I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Hirsch, and I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I've been teaching college English for 16 years, and I have been with CIDL for just over five years. Um, I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation, so if you have specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, feel free to post them to the chat thread, and I will address them as they come up, or you can hold off until the end if you want to. Um, Let's get to know everyone here. So in the text chat, tell us your department or division, your role, and explain what you hope to get out of this workshop. And uh, we'll give you just a minute to do that. And I will we'll turn off my camera. Great. Hi, Rob, on the other side of the building. <laughs> Hello, Amanda. How are you doing? I'm good. Good, good. All right, so we've got some nursing, communication here. And we have a good um, variety of departments represented here today. So as you're doing that, I'm going to move to the next slide as well um, so that you can also share an emoji. So how are you doing today? Share an emoji in the chat. There's an emoticon um, icon below the say something area in the chat. You can click on that. You can search for emojis there. Um, and I will share one as well. Share my, my coffee cup. Finished my first cup of coffee, I'm probably going to go grab some more. <laughs> Great. Hi, another nursing faculty. <clears throat> All right, I will move us right along here. Um, so if you're still typing up your introduction, great. Uh, public administration, great, awesome. Um, so let's talk about some objectives. In this workshop, we're going to explain what it means to humanize an online course. That's just kind of the foundation of uh, the talk today, um, kind of underlying everything. We're going to also discuss disengagement in asynchronous online courses and see what some students had to say about that in a survey. Uh, we'll explore experiential learning and critical thinking, look at the benefits of case studies and simulation and student learning and engagement, examine some examples of case studies and simulation that could be deployed in online courses. And I've tried to um, provide some examples, some general examples that could be used in the disciplines that you all have. I looked at, you know, what your your departments were before this and kind of try to tailor it to that. Um, and we'll brainstorm some ways to integrate these strategies into your individual disciplines too. So you'll get a chance to brainstorm that and share your ideas. All right, so first things first, um, I wanna give you a chance to think and then share with everyone what you've noticed in your online courses in terms of student engagement and learning. And another question um, is, what are you interested in learning more about case studies and simulation in online courses? So I'll give you a few minutes to think 
and then type up in the chat um, your answers to those two questions could we so we can kind of see where we're all at. Okay, great. So we've got some um, comments here in the chat um, that some students really enjoy the case participation. Some students are much more engaged than others, um, not really seeing an in-between, either really engaged or not engaged at all. Um, case studies and simulations could help students understand concepts more, um, might give them a jumping off point to start talking and sharing. Um, I think that's um, definitely uh, the last comment here is great. Students are asking for synchronous meetings, but when we hold them, they, they don't attend. Um, kind of similar to when students sign up for their face-to-face -face classes, you know, now post-pandemic or if we are post-pandemic and then not showing up for class. Um, asking for case studies, hope to find a good way of doing case studies and hopefully making grading them objective and easy. Great. All right, so let's talk about what it means to humanize an online course. To make an online space feel more human, it's important to focus on building genuine relationships. And I know that can be difficult in an online class, um, in an asynchronous class particularly, but that makes it all the more important. And these con connections help students bond, they help create mentorship opportunities with instructors, they also encourage a deeper engagement with the material. There are countless ways to support and maintain these relationships. Um, using experiential learning methods like case studies and simulations can make a course feel more personal, especially um, if they're designed to encourage interaction among students and also with the instructor. Experiential learning is a great tool to humanize an online class. Um, humanizing an online course is particularly crucial in fields like nursing, communications, teacher training, psychology counseling. Um, in nursing, building strong connections can help students feel more comfortable discussing sensitive patient care scenarios, seeking advice from instructors. In communications, maybe fostering relationships can help improve collaboration on projects like crisis communication plans where teamwork and understanding different perspectives are key. Um, for teacher training, humanizing the course helps future educators practice and reflect on their interpersonal skills, and that's essential for effective classroom management and student engagement. Um, in psychology, creating a supportive online environment allows students to share personal insights and experiences. That can be vital for understanding complex mental health concepts. In counseling, strong connections enable students to practice empathy and active listening and role-playing exercises, um, better preparing them for those real-life counseling sessions. So using experiential learning methods like case studies and simulations, they can help make a course feel more personal, especially if they're designed to encourage that interaction. So experiential learning, in other words, so just a great tool to humanize our online course. We can also try other approaches to, to humanizing the online course, posting a welcome video, sharing some personal information, finding other ways to foster those connections with everyone in the course. Um, but those tend to be things that we do, you know, at the beginning of the semester, and we really need something to sustain those connections throughout the semester. And case studies and simulations can be a strategy to do that. <clears throat> um, some examples of, you know, how using that, those case studies or, or simulations could help with particular um, 
concepts or particular strategy, uh, subject matters. Um, you know, nursing students might work through a simulated emergency room scenario together. Um, communication students could develop and critique each other's PR strategies in a simulated crisis. Uh, teacher training students could participate in virtual classroom management simulations, whereas psychology students might analyze and discuss detailed case studies. Counseling students could engage in mock counseling sessions, et cetera. And we'll talk a bit more about different options as we go on. So as educators, it's I've you've said that engagement can be an issue. So it's difficult to be sure why students are disengaged unless we ask them directly. Um, there was a Harvard Business College survey of students. So here are some of the common reasons why students disengaged according to that survey. Um, professors just lecture with no energy or passion for the topic. So many possible distractions at home. Lack of real world application. If the lecture is too long, it can be challenging to keep students continuous attention. And some professors read the content directly from the presentation slides without explaining it further, and that can make for a boring lecture. Um, so those are just a, you know just a sampling. And if you want to find out you know about your own students, you can also you know, ask them as well um, in a mid semester or an end of semester survey that can inform you know your own practice too. Um, so let's zero in on a specific comment from this small survey, and that's the lack of real world application. Here's what that student had to say about its importance. So the student said, um, lack of real world application, students are increasingly finding educational value from other resources and questioning the gap between what is taught in classrooms and what they need to learn to excel in the real world. Rather than extensive reading assignments and large cumulative tests, professors should consider integrating timely current events or discussions into their material. Many topics from STEM to humanities can also be taught more effectively through project based application. Um, so to address that feedback about the lack of real world application in courses, uh, let's talk about some specific examples about how to improve the learning experience. So um, one example that the student mentions is integrating current events. So for nursing, maybe we in, in incorporate recent medical breakthroughs or public health issues into lectures and discussions. For example, discussing you know, the latest COVID-19 treatment protocols or case studies on recent outbreaks. Uh, for communications, we might use current events to practice crafting press releases or managing PR crises. For instance, we might analyze how companies handle social media backlash in real time. Um, in terms of teacher training, we might discuss current trends in education technology or policy changes, like the, the impact of remote learning or new educational standards. Um, in a psychology class, you might explore recent psychological studies or current mental health trends. Um, for example, the psychological impacts of social media usage on teenagers, and that was just recently mentioned in the news. Um, the Surgeon General wants a warning on social media. Um, counseling, we might address contemporary issues like the mental health effects of climate change anxiety or the rise of teletherapy. Um, another thing that was mentioned by the student was project based learning um, for nursing. We might assign students to develop care plans for hypothetical patients based on real world case studies that could involve researching presenting on a recent medical condition or treatment for communications. We might have students create a comprehensive communication campaign for a real or a simulated company that could include things like market research strategy development implementation. Um, for teacher training. We might engage students in designing lesson plans and teaching strategies for diverse classroom scenarios, followed by peer review and, and peer feedback sessions. In a psychology course, we might implement projects where students have to design and conduct a small scale psychological study or intervention and then present their findings and implications. For counseling, we might conduct role playing exercises where students practice counseling techniques with peers acting as clients and then focus on different real life scenarios like grief counseling or conflict resolution. Um, another thing mentioned by this student was timely discussions and that might look in a nursing course like facilitating discussions on ethical dilemmas in healthcare that have emerged from recent events like vaccine distribution ethics or patient privacy concerns in the digital age um, and communications. You might lead debates on the impact of new communication technologies or platforms like the role of AI in journalism or the ethics of influencer marketing. For teacher training, we might talk about the implications of new teaching methodologies or policy changes like the benefits and drawbacks of standardized testing 
you know, an ongoing discussion there. Um, for psychology, we could create forums for students to discuss the societal impact of psychological research, like the impact impact of um, findings on addiction or the role of psychology in criminal justice reform. And for counseling, we might encourage conversations about new approaches to therapy, like the use of virtual reality and exposure therapy, or integration of mindfulness practices in counseling sessions. And then um, one other thing that the student mentioned was reducing heavy reading and testing. Um, so one way that we might be able to do that in nursing, maybe replacing some reading assignments with interactive modules or videos that demonstrate clinical skills, um, using frequent low stakes quizzing to reinforce the learning instead of maybe a large cumulative test. Although I know with you know certif certification testing and things, they do need practice with that, but finding ways to maybe add some low stakes quizzes in there as well um, to test that knowledge more discreetly. Um, for communications, we might assign more practical tasks like creating media content or analyzing case studies instead of extensive reading, um, using small frequent assessments to gauge their understanding of that. Um, in terms of teacher training, maybe encouraging the use of reflective journals or teaching simulations in place of heavy reading um, or implementing portfolio assessment that includes a variety of teaching artifacts. Um, and I know that's something that's already done um, on a macro level for a teacher training program. Um, psychology, we might incorporate more experiential learning activities like lab experiments or field work, uh, regular formative assessments to track progress. And then in counseling, we might utilize case study analyses and practical counseling sessions as key assessment tools rather than you know, exams or readings. Um, by integrating these strategies, um, if, you know, they appeal to you and that they'll work for you and your outcomes for your course, educators can create a more engaging and a relevant learning experience that bridges that gap between academic knowledge and real world application and address those concerns raised by students like this one. Um, so experiential learning is a dynamic and it's an immersive educational approach. It emphasizes learning through direct experience and reflection. Unlike traditional methods that primarily rely on things like lectures, textbook reading, experiential learning engages students in hands-on activities, real-world problem solving, and active participation. And this method allows learners to apply theoretical concepts to practical situations, um, which enhances their understanding and retention of the material. So by actively involving students in the learning process, this type of learning, experiential learning, fosters critical thinking, it encourages collaboration, it prepares students to tackle real life challenges with confidence and competence. Um, so on the screen here, we have um, experiential learning as described by Kolb in 1984. Um, we have concrete experience. This is where the learner encounters a concrete experience and it might be a new experience or situation. It could be a reinterpretation of existing experience in light of new concepts. Um, and then we have reflective observation of the new experience. So the learner, in other words, is reflecting on that experience in the light of their existing knowledge. Um, of particular importance here are any inconsistencies between experience and understanding. Then we move to abstract con conceptualization, um, which is where reflection gives rise to a new idea or a modification of an existing abstract concept that the person has learned from their experience. Then we move on to active experimentation, and that's where the newly created or modified concepts give rise to experimentation. And the learner applies their ideas to the world around them to see what happens. Um, according to experts, instructors aim, aiming to cultivate critical thinking skills should incorporate experiential exercises that place students in challenging scenarios. And these exercises should encourage students to blend factual and theoretical knowledge to identify key elements of the situation. Um, this process involves organizing evidence, validating assumptions, and choosing suitable theories or analytical methods to make informed decisions. Um, and then I've got a quote here, there is an intimate and necessary relation between the process of actual experience and education. And that's from John Dewey. Um, experiential learning is also referred to as learning through action, learning by doing, learning through experience, learning through discovery and exploration. And instruction in this type of learning environment is designed to engage students with direct experiences that are tied to real world problems and situations um, where the instructor acts as facilitator rather than 
necessarily directing student progress. In um, experiential learning, the instructor guides, again, rather than directing the learning process, um, hopefully students become naturally interested in learning. And the qualities of experiential learning are those in which students decide themselves to be personally involved in the learning experience. Um, so they have a personal role in directing their own learning. So let's talk about some of the benefits of case studies and simulation in student learning and engagement. Um, among the various forms of experiential learning, case studies and simulations stand out as particularly effective, especially in an online course setting. Case studies provide students with detailed scenarios that mimic real life challenges. They allow them to analyze, discuss, develop solutions based on factual and theoretical knowledge. And then simulations, on the other hand, immerse students in realistic, interactive environments where they can practice skills, make decisions, and also see the consequences of their actions in real time. And both methods make the learning experience more engaging and practical, but they also facilitate a deeper understanding um, of and retention of that material. In the context of online courses, these uh, strategies can be seamlessly integrated through you know, digital platforms like our Blackboard platform, um, and they, they provide students with valuable hands-on learning experiences that bridge that gap between theory and then practice. The advantage of teaching with case studies and simulation is that students are, are actively engaged in figuring out the principles by abstracting from the examples and engaging with the simulation. And this helps students develop skills in problem solving and um, analytical tools, quantitative or qualitative, depending on the case, uh, decision making in complex situations, and also coping with ambigu ambiguities. All right, um, so case studies have been a staple in education for a long time, and as you, you've mentioned, several of you have used case studies. Um, they've been especially um, prominent in fields like medicine, business, the military. Uh, for example, you might have your students play the role of a school counselor dealing with a challenging or potentially dangerous uh, student situation. The case study involves gathering, gathering sim simulated information from various sources and guide students through analyzing the situation. And it can also include in, you know, maybe an online journal where students record their findings and compare them to possible solutions, which they would then email to the instructor after completing the case study. Um, simulations, on the other hand, let us interact with a physical model or an abstract process. So we want to think of things like, you know, flight simulators, digital games, um, virtual reality, when you need, um, or, or augmented reality, when you need an interactive way to help students grasp a difficult concept or process, um, simulations can be really effective in that case. They're usually more immersive than case studies because they actually require students to take on a specific role and solve a problem or work through an experience in that way. Um, so in a case study, students would be analyzing the situation more from the outside without assuming a role necessarily, although they could do that. Um, but the goal of a simulation is to actively involve students by putting them in a situation where they have to make decisions and solve problems and then see what the consequences are. Um, for nursing courses, for example, you could use simulations where students practice responding to medical emergencies or managing patient care. And in communications courses, simulations might involve students taking on roles in, in a crisis communication team uh, to handle a public relations disaster, for example. So those hands-on experiences can be invaluable for understanding and mastering complexities of their fields. <clears throat> Um, so I'll share these with you in an email for those of you who are here today um, later this afternoon. But here are some case studies that could be deployed in on, online courses. So we've got business case studies by company. Um, there's a case studies directory by Yale. Uh, there's case studies specifically on environmental science national from the Na National Science Teaching Association, um, health and social care social, um, case studies by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Uh, Journal of Teaching Cases in Public Administration and Public Policy from the University of Washington, and the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science from the University of Buffalo. So a lot of different resources there. Um, and then some simulation that could be deployed in online courses. Um, there's business simulations. Um, oh, thank you for that hallway to uh, 
is howway.org is now defunct. Thank you. Um, business simulations, these are for pay online. I'll have to go through and make sure that all of these, the rest of these work. Um, and I'll find a, a, an alternative for that one as well and send that along. Um, UCAR Center for Science Education had simulations, interactive simulations for science and math from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, the BBC has a Syrian refugee experience simulation and SPENT has a poverty simulation. And I will look for others as well. I'll double check that these, that all of these are still up, um, send them along to you and then I will look for, for some additional ones too. Um, thank you. Um, so let's talk about integrating experiential learning and teaching. And the process is plan, prepare, facilitate, evaluate. So a similar process as you would do for any teaching planning. Um, but we'll talk about how to do this specifically for experiential learning or EL learning. Um, EL learning stands for health stands for learning. Um, so once the experiential learning or EL experience has been uh, decided on, you want to plan the experience by tying it to the course learning objectives and you want to determine what students will need to successfully complete the exercise. Uh, resources like readings and worksheets, do they need research, do they need rubrics, supplies, directions to off-campus locations if that's applicable. Um, also determine the logistics, so how much time will be allotted for the students to complete the experience. Um, will students need to, you know, work outside of the online classroom? You know, do, are they going to need to go to one of these websites? Are they going to need to go somewhere in person? Um, how, will they experience, how will the experience end? What forms of assessment are you going to employ? Will you use ongoing assessments like observations, journals, uh, things like formative assessment, uh, an end of experience assessment like a written report project, self or peer assessments, combination of all three. Um, and then once we've planned it out, we want to prepare. So we prepare our materials, we prepare our rubrics, our assessment tools to ensure that everything is ready before the experience begins. Then we facilitate the experience. Um, so with most instructional strategies, the inst instructor commences the experience, but then we want to kind of refrain from providing students with all the content and information, completing answers to their questions. We want to guide students through the process of finding and determining those solutions for themselves. And they might find that difficult, but that's where the value in the experience comes from, is from tackling those issues and those questions and trying to work through them. Um, and then we evaluate. Uh, the success of any experiential learning activity can be determined during discussions, during reflections, a debriefing session. Um, debriefing as a sort of culminating experience can also help to reinforce and extend the learning process for our students. And in addition, we want to make use of assessment strategies that we've previously planned as well. So integrating experiential learning, particularly case studies and simulations into online teaching, requires this thoughtful planning, preparation, and facilitation and evaluation by carefully aligning the experience with our course objectives and providing the necessary resources for our students we can ensure that students are well equipped to engage in meaningful hands-on learning preparing the materials and assessment tools in advance guarantees that smooth execution of the activity and during facilitation it's crucial that we guide students through the process rather than just providing them with the answers we want to encourage them to to develop that critical thinking and problem solving um, ability. And then finally, evaluating the success of the experiential learning activity through discussions, through the reflections, the deb debriefing sessions, however we do that, um, can help reinforce and deepen that learning experience. And these steps not only reinforce the effectiveness of um, or enhance the effectiveness of online courses, but they also create a more engaging and interactive learning environment that mirrors those real world scenarios and gets at what that student had mentioned in that survey. Um, these are some additional resources and references. Um, so there's, you know, uh, some resource, for example, in the middle of the open access case study websites list and um, simulation is a teaching strategy using case studies to teach. So some more um, nuts and bolts resources that I will send along to you. Um, what I want you to do now is I want you to brainstorm 
Um, so what are some ways that you could integrate case studies or simulation into your individual discipline or specific courses? Um, because it might look different for different courses, even in the same field. What would be the benefit to your students and their learning? And how do you think it would change or improve outcomes in your online class? So I'll give you a few minutes to think and then um, yeah, add your thoughts to the, the Yeah, the engagement issue um, can be difficult. It's definitely something that needs to be, um, I, I think, particularly post pandemic. I found that my students are um, less comfortable engaging with each other um, or communicating with each other. Um, they're, I think, more used to communicating behind, you know, a computer screen or, you know, a smartphone um, on social media. And so face-to-face -face communication can be difficult. Um, but in an online class, it might be helpful to allow for that communication to be asynchronous. They might feel more comfortable with that. Um, and then kind of developing those 
connections between students early in the semester. Um, I try to give them some time and you know, force them to <laughs> communicate with each other. So for online asynchronous classes, I have them instead of doing, you know, an introductory um, discussion board, I have them record videos of themselves introducing themselves so that they can see each other, um, hear each other's voices and kind of get more comfortable and, and see that there's actual people there. Um, playing roles in the simulations, yeah, needing to work together and then interacting with a group. Um, that's great. <clears throat> um, so incorporating case studies asynchronously for online courses. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. There's, um, you can have, you, you can utilize AI too, to create some um, case studies. So I'll send you the, that link or those links to those repositories for case studies and simulations, but you can also use Leverage AI to do that or have students do that. So have them create a case study using AI and then kind of pick apart that case study or um, interact with it asynchronously. Um, what's difficult with asynchronous classes is, you know, you do get that gap between when students are communicating with each other, for example. Um, it might take them longer, so you might need to give more time for them to complete a simulation or a uh, case study uh, in an online asynchronous class because they're taking an asynchronous class because they have, you know, busy schedules or they've got, you know, weird schedules and so they might not all be able to interact at the same time or, or synchronously so giving them more time on that might benefit the uh the outcomes for the case study um, depending on how you have them working together with that um, giving them a space you know setting up space for them to communicate is also helpful um, whether that's a discussion board or you know, setting up a, a shared document in OneDrive or something like that. Um, you know, setting that up for them helps to take away that um, initial getting uh, getting things off the ground a little bit. Um, so I've done that for my students too. Um, I've also had my students, it's for a literature class, but um, it could work for any class I think is the, you know, the first week of our class, I have them set up. They can choose to do either a blog or a vlog or a podcast, um, and they're gonna continue with it and post you know, one entry a week on whatever we're reading that week. So that could be something that you could also do to add some variety in there as well as have them talk about case studies in a podcast episode or um, a vlog or in a blog, um, a blog post. Um, so just thinking of maybe some creative ways to get them engaged with the material and give them different options or choice for how they communicate um, their findings um, or communicate you know, what they're doing um, and are assessed formatively is also a good idea. So maybe you know, they don't wanna you know, write a lot, but they're comfortable videotaping themselves or um, recording their voice, talking about what they want to talk about. Just a few ideas. Does anyone have any more ideas for how you have already incorporated case studies and simulations into your course or what specific challenges you have uh, faced when doing so? And I'll put this up too. <clears throat> so if you have any questions for me, and if I can't answer the questions, you know, or, you know, need 
to look for more information for you, you can also mention that too. Um, so if you want specific resources, um, then let me know that too, and I can find those for you and send them along in my follow-up email. Any other questions or insights, resources you'd like me to share, things you'd like me to research for you? All right, well, if you think of anything, please reach out to me. Um, you can reach out to CIDL as well. And if you go to our help site, uh, niu.edu slash CIDL slash help, it gives you some different opportunities um, or options for uh, how to contact us. You can contact us online, by phone, web conferencing, set up a meeting with us. Um, also, be sure to check out our upcoming programs. We have our summer programs listed, which you probably already know because you're registered for this one, but we have some more. Um, so check those out too, and check out our website as well for more um, information, resources, those things. Uh, like I said, later today, I will send a follow-up email to all of you who are here today live. Um, and I will include links to those resources. And uh, you can always respond to that email too if you have any other needs or any other questions that you can think of before then. Um, but otherwise, have a great rest of your day and have a great summer. <laughs>